purpose of this luncheon is to really encourage young ladies to persist in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. The fact that you're here at the championship of FIRST tells me that you should be seriously considering a career in a STEM field. There's lots of statistics we could share with you. Um, one of them that I find most interesting is that do men and women make the same in the same job statistically? No. No. That's right. And on average, for most occupations out there, same jobs, women make about 77% of what a gentleman makes, of what a man makes. So, but it's a little different in the STEM fields. And this is where you should feel very encouraged. Statistically speaking, US, women make about 92% of what a man makes in a STEM field. And for this reason, um, wealth, wealth brings power, power brings change. This is how we make the world a better place. So you have a unique opportunity as women entering in STEM careers to make a difference in this world. So I really encourage you to continue following the path that you've already started and look for those opportunities. Many of you at your tables, or everybody should have a mentor at the table. Do we, can our mentors just you know, raise your hands around the room? Look at this. We've got about 50 technology professionals in the room today sharing with you different um, entry points into careers, answering questions that you may have. Feel free to answer or ask them any question you can think of. There's no stupid question. They're all good questions, and we're here to give you some insight. Uh, by the way, I'm Jules Webb. I'm the Associate Director for the Pre-Freshman Engineering Program at the University of Texas here in San Antonio. Are there any prep students in the room or former prep students? All right, <laughs> woohoo! see one of those. Uh, so we're a summer program for students to want to kind of get a jump ahead and be prepared for careers in STEM. We are across the state of, the, of Texas. We are across the country. So if you have questions on that, you ask me. And my background is I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry, and I worked as an analytical chemist for a, a quality control in a pharmaceutical company for some years. And then I moved into education, which is something that a lot of women do, but it's been a very rewarding que uh, career on both sides in academia and in industry. Well, without further ado, I would like to bring up um, someone who's helped put on the event today as well. So we'll give a big round of applause for Sharon Berg. Come on up. So Sharon and I, about a month ago, uh, Patrick Felty, our regional director for FIRST, said, there he is in the back of the room. Hey, Patrick said, hey, would you all like to coordinate the Women in Technology Luncheon for FIRST? And we said, yes, absolutely. And then I realized it was happening a whole month earlier than the year before. Last year we were at the end of March, this year we're at the end of February. So I'm very pleased to say that our community stepped up and our lead sponsors, Hallmark College and Precision Group, Precision Mold and Tool, came in and made this possible, along with 12 table sponsors, and you'll see their names um, displayed on the tables as well as in our program. I do want to recognize and honor all of those that made it possible with their financial support. There's a few individuals in the room that made some personal donations as well. Let's just give them a big round of applause and a big thank you. With that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Sharon, who will introduce our keynote speaker for the event. And to give you an idea of what will take place, we will have our keynote speaker, a couple of closing words, and then you'll be back off to competition. And for all you FTC, you can go back and find out what happened in those alliance uh, determinations. Thank you. And really, we all need to thank Jules, because she is a person, if you're around San Antonio, STEM-related activities, inevitably, you will see Jules involved. And she also is a mother. She's very active in her profession, but she chooses to give of herself so that we can all celebrate as women de develop great career paths in STEM-related fields. So could we please give a hand to Jules Webb for all her hard work? Okay, show of hands, how many people have read the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg? Okay, so you remember in that book there was a reference to a study that was done by Harvard that showed that when men were successful, their peers 
were happy for them. They liked them a little bit more because they were successful. But that when women were successful, their peers, whether they were men or women, didn't like them as much. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you something. Maybe we're just defying the odds, but look around this room. There isn't a single person who isn't celebrating your success, whether it was a man or a woman. So the first thing you need to know is we love you. We are so excited you're here, and we're so excited about what you're doing. Thank you. So I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today. And <clears throat> I wish I could say I have this bio memorized, but I have to be honest with you, I'm gonna struggle with some of the words. They're pretty big. She is a very, very accomplished leader in, in technology. Susan Pope is the Assistant Director of the Department of Space Science at Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. She has a master's in engineering management from UT Austin, and she also has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from UT Austin. If that wasn't enough, she's also done many interesting things with Southwest Research, and she will tell you about some, but I'm gonna highlight a few. She has served as the Southwest Research Institute in various roles, including the lead mechanical engineer for a variety of sounding rocket science space instruments. She was part of the engineering team to work on the Medium Energy Neutral Atom, M-E-N-A. How many know about that? Okay, she might tell you about it later. Imager, a part of the image for <laughs> Magnetopause to Aurora mission, which is an acronym image. Now, my children would love to be in the audience right now laughing at me, but I'm doing the best I can. Mrs. Pope was the lead mechanical engineer for the design, fabrication, assembly, and testing for ALICE, which is also an acronym. She'll tell you about that, but it's a UV spectrometer. Aren't you excited that I knew how to, because I actually have a guy who, in, my, in our friends, we have someone who actually works in that area, that is part of the Rosetta mission. Mrs. Pope was the systems engineer for the SWAP, which is the solar wind around Pluto, and the lead mechanical engineer for the ALICE, both part of the science payload on New Horizons mission. She was the mechanical systems engineer for the TWINS, which is another acronym, which stands for two wide angle imaging neutral atom spectrometers instruments. Mrs. Pope served as the mission systems engineer for the IBX mission, and she has overall responsibility for the technical aspects of that mission. Mrs. Pope was recently recognized as a 40 under 40 accomplisher in San Antonio. So she's involved in many aspects. I did cut her bio a little short. It's much longer. We'll make it available online. But if any of you were questioning whether we were gonna have a high quality speaker today, I think you should rest assured you're gonna learn something very interesting. So please join me as we welcome Susan Pope to the, uh, to the podium. Thank you very much, Sharon. Okay, so I'm gonna have to consult notes too because I'm gonna talk about launch dates and I don't remember where, when everything was launched. So, um, so as Sharon mentioned, my name is Susan Pope. I, am, um, I work at Southwest Research Institute, which is um, about 20 minutes from here in San Antonio. And I'm gonna start out with just a couple of things about myself and then I'll move into the really fun stuff about rockets and instruments and things. So, um, so about me, I was, um, you can, oh, I need to switch the slide, let's see. Let go, all right, we're good. Okay, so um, I'm, not, I'm not under 40 anymore. So I just turned 40 this year, so I can't claim that anymore. But, um, but I was born in England, we moved here, um, to, I grew up in Houston, so we moved here when I was five. And I don't have a British accent because I went to kindergarten in Houston. And they didn't really like the British accent. So, um, so my mom does though, and my dad does. And in 92, I graduated from Jersey Village High School. I um, also went to an engineering camp um, in between my junior and senior year at University of Houston. And to me, that was one of the most, one of the important things for me to understand, you know, what did I wanna do? 
I always liked science and engineering or science and math and you know I broke the curves on the calculus test and things like that but I was like well what do I want to do and so I it really helped me sort of focus in on what kind of engineering do I want to do you know how, how do I want my career to go and so I focused on mechanical engineering pretty much because again I didn't know what I wanted to do and mechanical engineering is very broad um, so I graduated in 96 from UT Austin and right after that I started working at Southwest Research Institute and I fell into the job. Um, I wasn't a space junkie, I am now. Um, some people that work there in our space science and engineering division have always loved space. And I mean, I've always loved space. It's cool, rockets are cool, right? But um, I, I ended up, sort of fell into the job and I, I love it. I've done so many different things and I'm apologize in advance. I tend to talk a little fast whenever I talk about what I do because I love it so much. So I try to slow down to the point where I don't think I'm talking fast at all and then it's a normal speed. So just as maybe something that you might think of in the back of your head next time you give a talk. Um, but anyway, so I've worked there ever since 97, so I've been there a little over 17 years, served many different roles, as Sharon said. And um, while working there, I decided that I wanted to go into management. So instead of just focusing on the technical side, I decided I wanted to go into management. So I got a, I, that's when I got my, um, my engineering management degree, from, also from UT Austin. And um, I have been a manager for a while. I was recently promoted to assistant director, and then, of course, the 40 under 40. And then I just recently passed my project management professional exam. So I don't know if there's any other PMPs in the room, but it was a very challenging exam. And I'm really glad I did it. Um, it's interesting how you can pick little snippets out of things that you, that you sort of go to a training class for and apply those snippets in the different parts of your life. So, so that's about me. And when I'm not... Let's see, make sure that flips. They got pictures on it? Okay, cute boys pictures. So, um, so this is just a little about me. I didn't realize this would be live streamed. I didn't tell my husband that his picture is gonna be live streamed. But, um, so the picture on the left is me in a triathlon. So that's what I do whenever I'm not um, with my family or working. And I have a five-year-old. So we just, we stopped at one. That was a little decided how we, are. he starts kindergarten. I can't believe he's gonna start kindergarten. He's this tall. Um, and we travel a lot, so I'm very fortunate that I travel for work in sort of unfortunate and fortunate because you stay away from your family, but I get a lot of frequent flyer miles. So I get to fly my family to different places. So Casey's already been to Colorado, I think four times in Florida, and since I was born in England, I have family there, so he's been to England. And so we're very fortunate that we're able to do it. And I exercise not just to stay in shape, but to stay sane. Um, when you're really busy, I find that you have to find something to relieve your stress. And to me, exercise is what I do. So some people like, like to focus, sit down, do yoga, stuff like that. I'd rather go out and run. So, um, so that's what I do pretty much six days a week. Um, and I have to force myself to fit it in because I don't, I really, I really do feel it. Um, okay, so now to the fun stuff. So this is, I mentioned earlier, I work at um, Southwest Research and um, I work with really, really great scientists and engineers. We are about 300 in our division, and most of them are scientists and engineers, although we would never be able to do our job without our technicians and our administrative staff. They're amazing. And um, they, the thing that I always think of whenever I'm talking about my career is how important it is to focus on the non, that did switch, didn't it? Okay, good. Um, is to focus on the non-technical side. It, you get an engineering degree and they don't teach you how to write, but you gotta write a lot in an engineering, <laughs> and you have to present. Um, I never took a speech class, and when you present technical, it's, it's easy because you know your technical stuff. But um, whenever you do something like this, or I've been in, an, I was in the planetarium show that they had out at SCOBY, and I had to sit, stand in front of a green screen and like read what was going in front of me and it was hard, it was very hard. Much harder than designing instruments because I did that every day. So it, it, it you know, and then reading, you know, of course have to read a lot and then of course there's the math and science, the technical side that you gotta know, of course. Um, and then the other thing I didn't put up here, well, actually I did, it's the very top one, I just forgot to talk about it, is interpersonal skills. Um, being able to work with different types of people um, in, in, the, in the world out there and in school and wherever you are, you'll notice that people have different personalities. So you realize that in order to work with somebody, you have to treat one person different than another person. 
And that's one thing that they really hammer into you in management, um, but it's something that's very good from a perspective of living in the world. Um, you can't treat everybody the same. You have to approach somebody differently. Um, as a woman, um, as Sharon mentioned, as a woman, you have to realize that some people don't necessarily like that you're ahead, um, but you, you just have to you know, deal with it and go on. So, okay, so fun stuff. I have built instruments that are orbiting Mars, I don't have pictures of those, orbiting the Earth, um, orbiting, and go on their way to Jupiter, on their way to Pluto, and on the way to a comet. So um, I don't know the count of the instruments that I've designed, but I spent the first pretty much six years or maybe eight years of my career um, specifically designing instruments. So you know, the scientists have an idea, they tell the engineer the idea, the engineer goes off and designs it and tells the scientists, well, you can't do all of that just doesn't work. You can't build it. Um, and so, so these are pictures. Let's switch to a bunch of pictures. All right. So these are some of the pictures of the um, projects that, that Sharon mentioned earlier. So IBEX is the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. And everybody should have stickers. And um, there's some, uh, hopefully they're on all the tables. There's not enough for everybody, I apologize. But I also procrastinated. And so I just ran around this morning at 9.30 trying to get as many stickers and um, giveaways as I could find. So I think there's enough of IBEX stickers, and if you turn them on the back, they have information on the mission. There's a little um, a paper model that you can make of the magnetospheric multi-scale um, space spacecraft. And so those are, again, I think there's only five of those on the table. So those are just fun things to do. You can go on the web and you can print a lot of this stuff out. It actually does a very good job at education and public outreach. Um, so where things are, so IBEX is, is one of the, I worked on the mission, I worked on a couple of the instruments on IBEX too. Um, TWINS is the two wide angle imaging neutral spectrometer. Um, that was launched, there were two spacecraft that were launched. Um, and that, um, I didn't actually didn't write down when that was launched, I think it was launched in 2002. And IBEX was, I was eight months pregnant when IBEX launched, so I won't forget that launch. That was October of 2008. Um, and then IES and ALICE, and ALICE is actually not an acronym. So that's okay. The scientist that, um, um, that was our lead scientist for, Al for ALICE, um, he just liked it. He just liked the name. He thought it was pretty. So next to ALICE on New Horizons is an instrument called Ralph. So some of you may get it, some may not. Um, but Anyway, so we didn't actually work on Ralph. We worked on Alice. Um, Ralph was an, 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 an imager. And um, SWAP is solar wind around Pluto. And I don't have any pictures of the spacecraft. But my next slide goes through and tells you sort of where everything is, which I thought as I, this morning as I was looking it up, I thought it was pretty cool. But MENA is the first instrument I ever worked on. So MENA on the bottom right is a medium ener energy neutral atom instrument. And I started working on that in 97 when I didn't know what the magnetosphere was. Um, now I don't really know what the magnetosphere is, but I can at least say it and spell it. Um, but, um, I mean, I can sort of explain what it is, but I think if a real magnetospheric scientist heard me explain it, they would probably tell me, you know, what are you talking about? But other people, it, you understand it. It's, the, it's the, um, the area around the Earth that protects us from the solar wind is pretty much what it is. It's how our magnetosphere, magne magnetic fields interact with the solar wind. I do have a little picture of it on the next slide. So we'll go to the next slide. And this tells you where some of them are. So I'll start with the one, so the top right picture is uh, showing the magnetosphere. So you can see the, the lines that are on that picture are the Earth's magnetic field. And everybody's heard of the aurora, I'm sure. And so um, on the top and bottom of that, where you see where the lines come together, that's called the cusp. And that's pretty much where the aurora is. And what the aurora is, is ions and electrons that are flowing down those magnetic field lines interacting with the, with the um, atmosphere of Earth. And that's one of the things that we do a lot of studying. Um, the scientists that I work with, we, we study that magnetosphere. And um, the image mission, which is the one that MENA was on, that was the first one that, um, that it was a really groundbreaking mission and actually wrote a lot of, uh, rewrote textbooks on the magnetosphere because they were able to discover a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and by the way, that's the, probably the most rewarding thing about doing what I do is hearing about the missions in the news, turning on Discovery Channel and seeing one of the scientists that I work with talk about how the image mission, which I built one of the instruments on, 
is discovering things about our magnetosphere. So it's very rewarding to hear that and know that you designed that little bitty part of it. I mean, it may just be a little part, but at least you helped with it. So um, the next one that was launched, I think it was New Horizons. Let me check my checklist here. Nope, Rosetta was launched first. So Rosetta is actually a European Space Agency mission, and that's the one that Alice was on. And um, Alice was the first, sort of my first experience with realizing that I was working, designed things for space. Um, I remember I got a call on a Saturday night after Rosetta launched that the door didn't open. And I'm thinking, what do you want me to do about that? It's out there in space. Um, but luckily, NASA and ESA requires that you do it a lot of redundancy. So we tried to fire the door once, and um, this is in order to actually get light into the instrument. We had to cover it up because of the contamination, um, and you have mirrors in there. You can imagine mirrors don't like particles falling on them. Um, that sort of messes with the optical properties a little. But um, so I got a call, and they fired the, um, as I was on the phone, we could hear the mission, you could hear the mission um, operations center getting the call that um, you know, they had sent the command to the, because they have to send the command out there to, to open the door, which is with our second signal. So our first signal didn't work, first command didn't work. The second command went out, and then you gotta wait a few minutes because the signal's gotta go out to the spacecraft. And then it's gonna come back to the mission center. So I knew it came back when the big roar went up in the room that was excited because the door opened and they were able to see counts. So um, that was sort of my first, wow, that's really weird because what I built is way out there and you can tell it what to do. Um, so the other cool thing, and you see this in the Rosetta, um, the screen here, and you can't read that, but I have some links to some websites that you can look at. But Rosetta is actually, um, I think it's got a gravity assist from Earth, Mars, another one from Earth. And so it looks like two Earth gravity assists, two, three Earth gravity assists and one Mars gravity assist um, to help it get where it wanted to go. So that's physics. You know, once you go out there, you got nothing else pushing on you other than gravity from all the different planets. And so that's how we get our, rock, our spacecraft to where they want to go. So you can see the Rosetta. If you look at those numbers, um, I'm sure you can't read them because they're, they're pretty small. I just screenshotted it from the website. But Rosetta is currently 731 million miles away. So it was launched, I said, in 2004. And let's see. New Horizons was next, launched in January of 2006. And New Horizons is on its way to Pluto. Um, so one of the fun things looking at this is, um, I'm gonna step down, can I step down? Try not to fall. Is you can see, I don't know, does that actually work? You can see, so the Earth's in the center here, and Jupiter's in there somewhere, sort of really close to the Earth, and that's where Pluto is, right? So the green line is actually where we've already traveled, and then the, the rest of it is where we are getting to Pluto. So Pluto is two point, or New Horizons is 2.7 billion miles away from the Earth right now. And I actually worked on two of the instruments on New Horizons. I'm trying to fall again. That's why I work out, so I can step up and down on the podium. Um, and so, so New Horizons was, again, one of the first instruments I worked on, but it hasn't even completed its prime mission yet. So it's actually gonna get to, um, to Pluto. It's, it's just gonna fly by. It's not even gonna orbit Pluto. It's just gonna sort of fly by and we're gonna cross our fingers and hope that everything works the way it's supposed to. They're doing a lot of tests, to, you know, trying to make sure that New Horizons is actually gonna work. They did a flyby of Jupiter, really good science there. Um, a lot of understanding about the, um, the area around um, Jupiter. Um, so it's gonna get there next year, so a little over, a little over a year from now in July. I forgot to actually tell you about Rosetta. So Rosetta was a European Space Agency mission. And the other missions that I have on here are through NASA. Um, they actually put Rosetta to sleep because they didn't have the money to fund all the mission operations. And I don't know how long it was asleep, but it actually woke up on January 20th of this year. And they literally, the only thing running was just a little bit of power and they had an alarm clock that went off. So I guess the alarm clock told everybody to wake up well, all the computers to wake up on the, and so there, and everything woke up, and so everybody was very excited there, and the, so the instruments, they'll start um, being what we call commissioned, which is pretty much making sure they work the way they're supposed to work. Um, okay, so next is, um, let's see, IBEX launched next. I told you I wouldn't forget that launch. 
Um, I was here during the launch. Ibex launched from a small island in the Pacific called Kwajalein. Um, Kwajalein is about halfway between Hawaii and Australia. It's definitely the smallest place I've ever been and the only place I've had to rent a bike because they don't have automotive. They, don't ha they have like emergency vehicles on the island. So when I put my expense account in, that was a little funny call from the expense account personnel. Why did you have to rent a bike? Because that's what I got from my hotel to the meeting, right? I mean, it's only a f the, the island is only, I did, ran around the island and, you know, I got a four-mile run in, so it's pretty small anyway. But, um, but it was fun to ride the little, they were like the old banana seat bikes, so they were fun. Um, so Ibex launched in 2008 and, uh, in October, and our prime mission was two years. So in, at the beginning when we won Ibex, which is, we st I started working on Ibex in 2005, so you're looking at about a three to four year turn on most of these spacecraft. And, from, and that's from nothing to having a spacecraft. Um, so just ideas in people's heads. Sometimes the ideas are more formed than other, other times. But um, generally that's what you're think, you're, you think of whenever you think of the, um, how long it takes. But IBEX launched into a, um, an orbit. and uh, IBEX orbits the Earth. And it launched in October 2008. The prime mission was done in um, about two and a half years from there. And now we're in what's called extended mission. So one of the things they did, and again, this is cool physics, is they fired their thrusters. They knew exactly how much delta V to fire their thrusters to put them in an orbit that was not as impacted by the moon's gravitational pull. So the initial orbit for IBEX was, um, if you notice, did I switch that, by the way? OK, yeah, I'm still good. Um, so the blue is the orbit for IBEX. And so you can see that where the moon is in relationship to the Earth, we're trying to stay away from the moon. Because if you get close to the moon, we're, so, we're five sixths of the way out to the moon, so we're at 50 RE, and it, it, the moon literally pushes our orbit. And um, it works to get the science we want, but then you have, to re, you have to use fuel to move your orbit around and get it back to where you want it to go. And so the orbit dynamics um, folks who were working on IBEX figured out a way to change the orbit so we um, rotated like the way it's shown there on the screen where, where you avoid the moon. Um, and they did that during extended mission so that way they don't have to use as much fuel so they can last longer so they can get more data. Um, IBEX is actually looking at the, um, the, the solar system's helio, heliosphere. And so the magnetosphere is our sort of protection from the sun our heliosphere is our solar system's protection from interstellar space. So it protects us from radiation, not of course all radiation, because radiation still gets through. Um, but, and so IBEX actually looks out, I consider it like a fish in a bowl. So IBEX orbits the Earth, but there's two really big sensors, one on either side, and it, and it is a spinner, and so it spins around and it literally looks at a bowl, at, 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 our, at our bowl and looks at um, neutral atoms that are coming in from the from outer, you know, past our solar system. Um, again, I'm an engineer, not a scientist, so. But I think that is what actually they do. Um, I don't, just don't know exactly how they get that data that's, I don't know if you guys have ever seen science data before. It's like all, a lot of times when you see it plotted, it's like this rainbow plot. And you're like, ooh, that's pretty. But to a scientist, it actually means something. Um, and so, so that's what the scientists that I do, that I work for. So I put on here distance away from the Earth, which I thought was really cool. The other thing I did for Juno's um, velocity is, so Juno is currently moving at 15 miles per second. So pretty fast. And I think New Horizons is moving faster, but I couldn't find that um, very quickly. And you can see the Juno spacecraft has also had a gravity assist. It actually flew by the Earth to get to Juno. Um, but New Horizons, if we didn't launch the year that we launched, um, I think if we would have waited six months, it would have taken us two more years to get there, just because of the way the gravity assists work, because um, New Horizons used a lot of gravity assists from the different, they, when they passed by Jupiter, they were actually getting it in its gra gravitational field, so it would push it around faster, so they could get more. Um, so that is where they are. So now these are just some pretty pictures. So this is the magnetospheric multi-scale spacecraft that I, um, you have, that's what the little paper is. Um, this is the, uh, I started working on MMS in 2008. 
Um, and that's when we started doing our preliminary design for the, for the mission. And the, the paper you have there, is, it's just a little paper model of MMS. And so you can take the little side part off. I can see somebody's already done it. Um, you take the side part off and you have a bookmark. And then you can unclick everything that's, you need to sort of fold everything back and forth. And then you can make a little model. All you need is tape. I bring it to whenever I talk sometimes at elementary school. I brought it to there and they have fun time putting it together. Um, and on the back of it, there's information on, you know, what is, what are the instruments on the spacecraft. Um, and so what you see here, did I switch it? Nope, there we go. There's the pretty picture. It's, it is on my screen though, because so, I had to have this screen. So what you see here is in the background, that's a thermal vacuum chamber. So what we have to do with our spacecraft is, because we can't go fix it, we have to test it as much as we can on the ground. So in a sense, you sort of want it to fail so you can fix it, but you don't want it to fail because then it fails and then you gotta fix it. So, but you'd rather it fail here when you're on the earth when you can fix it than up, at the, up in space. So that's why we do a lot of testing. And one of the tests we do is make sure that it's gonna survive. Um, and so this is MMS in the thermal back chamber and then MMS, there's actually two of them, so there's a total of four. And um, I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to show my videos. You wanna see a solid rocket motor launch and you wanna see a, um, a rocket launch. Rocket motor fire, really loud, rocket launch. Okay, then we're gonna, we're gonna see the solid rocket motor fire. So that is solid rocket motor firing. That's a, actually a test that we do. So we, we, we didn't do it. This was actually done by ATK. So there's the firing of the solid rocket motor. And then I'm just gonna switch. This is the, um, and I'm just gonna let this, this video run while I'm um, finishing up. So this is the, Um, websites. So the best way to find out about um, missions is to go to the, is, is on the web. So if you're interested in any of these missions, you can look on the back of those stickers, or you can um, look on, look here and just do a search for NASA New Horizons or NASA Juno, or um, and and then you'll find more information about the missions. And so that's all I had to say. Sorry, I ran a little long. So. Okay. I so I don't know about you, but I think I have to find a way to use gravity assist somewhere in the next 24 hours.